I've sort of been through a number of iterations in my career. And the one we're going to talk about today is my study of psychopathy. I spent about 20 years studying psychopathy and violent behavior, largely among people in criminal justice systems. That doesn't mean that's the only place you find them, uh, people with psychopathy. Um, but it is a place where you are more likely to find more people who have psychopathic traits. So I'll talk about psychopathic personality, the construct and its implications. And these are just some thank yous to some of the people who really helped with this research along the way. Um, psychopathy as a term has undergone a lot of changes. It used to mean any illness of the mind, which is actually psychopathology now. Um, people talked about born criminals, liars and swindlers. Uh, and then in his work, Hervey Cleckley in 1970 or 1941, he was working in a state hospital and he recognized that there were a lot of people in the hospital who were there um, who were not psychotic and didn't have mental health problems in the way that most of the patients did, but rather just behaved in crazy ways. Uh, and these were the people with psychopathy. From there, Robert D. Hare uh, has done a lot of the, the more modern research making the elements of psychopathy or the psychopathic traits into a scale that is um, pretty psychometrically sound and useful. And so I won't talk too much about the DSM. I mean, the DSM has trouble with personality disorders because they take a while to uh, assess. It's not something that you can just go down a bunch of behavioral traits uh, particularly easily. So really, um, in the DSM, they don't, they don't make a lot of distinctions between psychopathy and these other terms. Antisocial personality disorder, which is the DSM version, is approximately 50 to 70% of people in prison, uh, characterized primarily by impulsivity, irresponsibility, and chronic antisocial behavior. And you can see that these things come from a lot of places and some of the contributing factors are childhood abuse, poverty, substance dependence, um, poor emotion regulation. And so that's not really psychopathy. Um, and in fact, less than half of the people who meet criteria for antisocial personality disorder have psychopathy. Psychopathy is a more, it's more rare and it's about 15 to 20% of prison populations and maybe one to 3% of the general population are people very high in psychopathic traits. And I'll describe what that is. So antisocial personality plus low anxiety um, and superficiality and lack of emotional depth and all of that, that's when you get into psychopathy. The problem with people with psychopathic traits is that they get into a lot of trouble and punishment and rewards don't work particularly well to keep them out of trouble. So people with psychopathic traits are more likely to go back to jail for nonviolent crimes. They are um, three times more likely than people low in psychopathy to go back to, to jail or prison for violent crimes. They have problems recommending or um, recognizing um, emotionality in other people's faces or voices. They have deficits in being able to learn from punishment on lab tasks. They have deficits in response to emotional material. They don't quite have uh, the depth of emotion that people without psychopathic traits tend to have. And they tend to do pretty poorly in treatment. A lot of the time it's because they feel pretty good about themselves and they feel that their problems are due to other people and they don't really have anything to change. So I'm gonna go through the psychopathy checklist items 
and talk about how it is that people identify people with psychopathy. These items, in case you're curious, it's, uh, it's on a two point scale from not present, uh, two is present, and one is some features of each one of these, but not, not enough to be a two. And then you total them all up uh, and find out how high the person is in psychopathy. So the first item on the psychopathy checklist is all about superficiality. If you spend, and I didn't mention this, but the psychopathy checklist is filled out after a pretty in-depth interview, usually like a two, two and a half hour interview with the individual you're assessing and then a file review. So if it's at a jail or prison, you'll get the files from the jail or prison, or if it's a, at a community program, you'll get their files. Um, if it's hospital, you can look at the medical records. And then based on what the person has told you during the interview and what you found in the records, you can score these items because the records don't always match up with what they tell you. So the first item, this glib and uh, superficial nature, um, sometimes charming. Maybe you've met some of these folks. They are uh, fast talkers might speak in a really smooth, easy way that you can't quite trust, but you want to because they're charming. Um, they may compliment you or try to establish a superficial connection with you. A lot of the time at the jail, I mean, it would be right off the bat, they'd walk in the room and be like, oh, I like your tie or I like your shoes. And so you have to wonder, uh, maybe they do just like your tie or your shoes. But in a lot of cases, um, it was part of a larger pattern to try to butter you up for reasons that aren't clear. Um, maybe just to manage your impression of them. Um, some aren't that polished. Some will just try to come across as tough and um, will say very little to you. Um, and that's their way of maintaining control of the interview. And that's absolutely they're right but if they're going to participate um you have to kind of open them up a little bit the second feature of people with psychopathy is that they are pretty grandiose they think they're great and it can get kind of boring because they go on and on boasting about how they're the best this and got the fabulous that um and it's all pretty shallow. Some of it's not true a lot of the times. Um, but they will claim to have famous connections. When I was doing jail interviews in Chicago, so many of the inmates claimed to be good friends with the mayor um, and things like that. They like to be seen as people who are important. Um, the other thing about the grandiosity part of it is it gets them caught a lot of the time. Uh, a lot of the time they think that they're, you know, if you've seen these crime shows, a lot of the time these folks are high in psychopathy and they think they can outsmart anybody and they get the feeling that, you know, they are just untouchable. And uh, even though they might boast about things that aren't true, and you might not believe them, and they might know you've caught them, doesn't matter. They just spin off into something else and start saying something else that's not true. So one of the things you'll notice as I go through this checklist, it's 20 items, but there's a lot of overlap with other stuff. So you can see that this is a basic attention deficit disorder problem for item three. Um, people with psychopathy do often have trouble paying attention. They get bored really easily. Um, they will say that boredom is kind of like pain. Um, and so they often enjoy exciting and risky activities to get rid of some of the boredom. They have high risk tolerance and it, it, they need more to feel alive in a lot of cases. So, um, they'll do some pretty crazy things. Um, a lot of people with psychopathy have plenty of um, 
speeding tickets um and they you know gambling drugs like cocaine that provide the quick high um and some of them will even just do really crazy stuff like hanging off of bridges playing chicken with cars or trains like just just to get a rush i apologize for the dog um he's too far away to do anything about <laughs> People with psychopathy lie often and easily, and they can even lie within the course of a sentence or a paragraph. They'll say one thing and then contradict it. But a lot of the time, because they're so um, smooth and charming, people don't catch that. Um, sometimes they lie just for the hell of it. You can't figure out why they're lying. It's not to get what they want. It's not to get out of trouble. It's just for the hell of it. And it's been termed duping delight. They just enjoy getting one over on people. And so when they're caught in a lie, um, they tend not to be too phased about it. They just spin right off into another subject or make an excuse and move on. Most of us would feel something if we're caught in a lie, like, oh, I'm caught. Um, but their lack of anxiety kind of enables them to just move in another direction. As a as an example of this sort of enjoying lying just for the hell of it. I had a guy I was talking to in the jail um, and I asked him what he did for work. And he said, Hidden Valley Ranch. And I said, oh, you work at Hidden Valley Ranch? He's like, yeah. And I said, oh, that, that's a salad dressing. And he was, he's like, yeah, right. We made salad dressing. I was like, oh, all right. Uh, and then he said, Fruit Loops. I was like, what? He said, yeah, so you probably don't know this because you've never worked at Hidden Valley Ranch, but we put Fruit Loops in the salad dressing. Uh, and that's what gives it its taste. So at that point, like, it's obvious the guy's lying. And I got, you know, usually when you're doing a psychopathy interview, you don't want to tell people you're on to them because you want to keep them talking. You want them to say more. But I couldn't resist. I said, you and I both know that there are no Fruit Loops in Hidden Valley Ranch dressing. Um, and he said, you don't have to believe me, but it's the truth. So I don't know what he was getting out of it other than just enjoying lying. Um, and he wouldn't even cop to it when it was obvious that you know, neither of us believed it. The fifth item is uh, people with psychopathy are conning and manipulative. Uh, I have met people, teens even, who seem to have been somewhat psychopathic since an early age. And running scams was just like, every day it was just like, what's the new scam to do? Um, because it was fun and they didn't recognize the danger and they didn't really have any empathy for the people who were being conned. So they'll even do it to so-called friends and family. Um, and they're basically treating people like chess pieces. So if you ask them, you know, do you run scams? They, they'll often brag about them. Um, and the problem with this is you're kind of only useful to a person with psychopathy uh, until you are useful. Uh, not useful to them and then you're discarded they don't they don't want anything from you except um to use you and um move on to the next person now i'm generalizing uh and if you're in a family with this person with psychopathy they'll be around um because they're family sometimes um but often this is this is the way it goes here's a real part of the disorder, um, lack of remorse or guilt, they may be incapable of truly feeling bad for what they've done. Um, so when you talk to them, they may say, well, I have remorse. But if you ask them why, they won't be able to really tell you. Um, some people have learned to say I have remorse just because they're in legal systems. Um, but they may also say, I have remorse, and then go out and do the same thing over and over again. And unless it's a compulsive disorder, which is very rare, um, 
usually it's they don't truly have the capacity for remorse they have the words but they don't have the emotion they may even boast about feeling sorry for people who feel guilt um sometimes in confidential interviews they'll say they've never felt sorry for anything or i'll get to the end of the interview and i'll ask them if they've ever felt sorry for anything they've done and they'll you know after recounting horrible crimes they'll say well yeah i stole baseball cards i feel bad about that or they'll say they they'll say they feel bad about never having gone to school um but no true remorse for the things that really are hurting other people. This is a related problem. So you can see that like we're kind of getting into a place where they don't have a lot of emotional experiences. They have shallow stuff. They can get angry and frustrated and excited. Um, they tend to go towards self-pity because they don't see how they're causing their problems. But no deep emotional experiences like love or sorrow or serious depression. Um, I've never met a person with psychopathy who had post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think that that says something. It's just not, there's not enough emotion, not enough anxiety uh, to develop that disorder. Hey, buddy. Sometimes they'll talk about deep emotions. They'll talk about people in really um, heavy terms, like she was my soulmate. But then it'll make it, then they'll make it clear that it wasn't really um, that emotional. First woman I ever loved, mother of my child. And then later, why did I love her so much? Uh, she was a ditzy blonde with a great body. That's probably what did it for me. So there's no sense of like depth to people with psychopathy. It's just not there. And here's another problem with psychopathy. Um, that's a picture of somebody melting an ant with a magnifying glass. Um, people with psychopathy, again, with the emotional deficits, um, they lack empathy. So they're just doing what they're doing. They're not really thinking about how it's going to feel to anybody else. So they may destroy other people's things or get carried away in fights and just keep wailing on somebody when they've already got them beat. Uh, animal cruelty, cruelty toward people. Um, people with psychopathy don't really understand what others feel except on a cognitive level. They don't get the emotions. In fact, uh, one guy I talked to, he had robbed a convenience store. And he went in and you're not going to leave me alone, are you? He went in, he had a gun, he had people on the floor. Um, and I said, what do you think they were feeling when you were pointing the gun at them? And he stopped for a little bit, like he was taken aback by the question. And then he said, excited. Um, just not even getting that uh, what he was doing was causing terror for these other people, because he's probably never felt that kind of terror. So people with psychopathy tend to be pretty lazy. Um, they tend to try to get money as easily as possible, which is not a bad idea, but they're often unwilling to work. They might fake injuries to get disability compensation. Um, we had one guy in a probation office who would go to these really expensive restaurants with people he barely knew. He would just buy them this giant dinner uh, and then bolt before the check came. And he did this uh, eight or nine times before he finally got caught. So he was just going around making friends, buying them dinner and then not actually paying for it. Um, they often avoid work attached to people with money or jobs, sometimes uh, they'll be with a partner until the partner loses their job, and then they'll find a partner who has a job. And then, you know, for, whether they're pimping or committing petty frauds, the idea is minimum work for maximum payoff. And there's nothing else that goes into it. That's right. 
another problem with people with psychopathy um, is that they tend to be very short tempered and hot headed. It's not just people with psychopathy. We've got plenty of people with this problem. But um, the nature of their anger is usually pretty shallow. They'll get angry, doesn't last very long, they blow up, might hurt somebody in the process, and then they're back to um, back to baseline, feeling okay again. People with psychopathy, though, will also flip out because they realize it can be effective in getting others to do what they want. So people with psychopathy tend to have numerous sexual partners. Sometimes they answer questions about that in the extreme, like 100 in the last year. Um, they have a lot of casual sexual encounters. And this is sort of, again, the same, same emotional deficit. If you have no deeper emotions, then sex is just sex. Um, and sometimes this gets them into trouble. They may have sexual offenses, um, including some very serious ones. A lot of kids have early behavior problems for a lot of different reasons. And some, sometimes it's abuse and sometimes it's neglect or poverty. Um, but people with psychopathy also have early behavior problems. And a lot of the time when you're looking back, you'll see that they had many suspensions and even expulsions from schools. Uh, they got in trouble for classroom disruption and repeated fighting, stealing and bullying. Another thing about psychopathy is that they do have goals, but they don't really work toward them. Um, and so those goals are often pretty unrealistic and grandiose. So sometimes they'll talk directly about plans to be rich and famous or may state that they want to start their own business or become a doctor, run a record company. So you ask them how they're going to achieve these goals and they've got no plan. And if you see them again a year later, they might have the same goals or they might have different goals, but either way, they'll have no plan. Um, and sometimes they talk about, I'm not really thinking about the future, which is not a bad strategy, um, but they could use a little more forethought, um, especially because the future usually involves uh, some sort of legal trouble. They are impulsive. They may quit jobs on the spur of the moment. Uh, a lot of the time, if you're talking to somebody with high levels of psychopathic traits, they'll tell you about seven jobs they quit after a month and it'll all be the same story. Yeah, I just, it's boring or I got sick of it or um, I just didn't want to be bossed around, stuff like that. They're impulsive in their uh partnering and leaving partners. And they're also impulsive in their crimes. People with psychopathy can plan a crime and carry it out, but they can also happen upon something uh, maybe in an unprotected older person with a purse or something uh, and be like, oh, I'm just going to do this. They don't really give it a lot of thought. People with psychopathy tend to be irresponsible. They don't think much about uh, bills. Um, they may neglect their children because they, again, that emotional deficit is kind of a big deal. Uh, they may spend money on drugs rather than providing for the family because drugs are meeting their needs. Um, and they do things like Excuse driving me, under the influence. Sorry, I see Dave's hand. I don't know if you can see everybody. I can't see everybody. Oh, yes. Sorry, I missed you there. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering what separates, you know, any non-psychopathic or low-end psychopathic person who measures on these criterion from, you know, true headline obtaining psychopaths? Yeah. Uh, well, 
first of all, that you're talking about two different things. One, it, the headline obtaining part is how bad are they, right? Like how 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 many things have they done that are bad or what sorts of things did they do? That tends to get the attention. But um, in order to figure out how psychopathic a person is, uh, this is on a scale of zero to 40. And um, the higher you go, the more psychopathic somebody is. So um, that won't tell you whether they're going to commit a, a horrendous crime or something. There are other factors involved. All it will tell you is that there wouldn't be anything to stop them. Like they don't have empathy. They don't feel remorse. Um, they might do really bad things. And so it does matter whether the person with psychopathy has been abused or not, whether, um, you know, whether their needs are being met, uh, whether they've got, I mean, if they've got a history of violence, they're more likely to commit violence in the future. So there, there are a lot of differences among people who score high on this scale. Uh, and most people with psychopathy are just walking around outside of prison and you might not know it unless you got to know them. Um, so I hope that sort of answers the question. There's no, and there's also no, like, there's a cutoff of 30 for calling somebody a psychopath when I started the research. I tend to try not to call people psychopaths because it's a pejorative label. I like to say people with psychopathy, but um, so between like 20 and 30, you've got people who are doing some stuff who are kind of sketchy, uh, who you might not want to trust, but they might not be full on uh, psychopaths, right? Um, so there are gradations of it. Okay. This is another, this is pretty clear when you see people with psychopathy. They don't take responsibility for what they've done. It's always somebody else's fault. Maybe it's the system, maybe it's other people, maybe they were framed. Um, if they do take any responsibility, they'll be like, oh, it didn't, you know, they'll tell you about this fight where they beat somebody to a pulp and put them in the hospital and then kind of downplay it by saying, well, it didn't really even bother and we're great friends now. Um, making, minimizing anything that they do. They may fake insanity. Uh, in extreme cases. Um, and then often when you interview them, they've also learned to say, I take full responsibility. So, because they've been in legal systems. And so they may say, well, I take full responsibility for what happened, but it wouldn't have happened if X, Y, and Z. So they're not really taking full responsibility. They just can't feel that part of it. They don't really have a conscience to be able to do it. Um, as you might figure, based on what I've already said, they tend to have many short-term live-in relationships. Uh, this is one thing that we can just count the number of them and use that toward assessment. They often have juvenile delinquency. Now, two-thirds of people who get into trouble with the law as juveniles will not go on to commit significant crimes. Most kids grow out of it unless they're sucked in by a legal system that's predatory. Um, but people with psychopathy, um, whether they're young, whether they're teenagers or adults, a lot of the time they've got serious offenses that you just don't expect with kids. They tend not to show up for parole hearing, probation, uh, requirements. Um, they might try to escape. They might not come to their court dates. They're, um, again, not super responsible and they don't think about the future. So they're not necessarily thinking about how they will be harmed by their failure to appear. And then finally, the last item on the psychopathy checklist is criminal versatility. People with psychopathy will commit a lot of different crimes. Um, so it's pretty common for people without psychopathy to 
have drug charges and speeding tickets and you know crimes in like one or two areas um if you're a if you're a substance user or dealer you're likely to get crimes uh possession and uh manufacture intent to distribute but people with psychopathy you look at their record and it'll be all over the place they'll have a charge for robbery and 10 speeding tickets and a few charges for fraud and all kinds of stuff so um that's one indicator is it's not just a career it's not just a business it's a lifestyle I do want to stress though that not all people who have psychopathic traits are violent and the violence level may depend in part on socioeconomic factors. Um, think about it. Like if you could think of a really rich, successful psychopath, um, and I can think of one, uh, then they don't really need to be violent in most situations to get what they want. They've got leverage on people. Maybe they're blackmailing people or running frauds or scams. Um, but the lower you are on the socioeconomic ladder, the more likely it is that you're going to be in violent situations. And um, so that, that does make a difference. Like I said before, people high in psychopathy are three times more likely to commit future violent crimes than people low in psychopathy. The problem with that is, sure, we know they're more likely to, but you can't really uh, you can't really predict that. I mean, it, you may have a person high in psychopathy who is never going to commit another crime, and so there's a real balancing act on the part of the legal system to try to keep people safe from people who are likely to commit violent crimes, um, but also to guarantee civil liberties. Um, sometimes people get confused about, you know, whether serial killers and psychopaths are the same thing. They're not. Most people with psychopathy are not murderers or rapists, or, and especially not serial killers. However, most serial killers do have psychopathy. So you've got a whole bunch of people with this disorder who don't have remorse and empathy and are maybe kind of dangerous, but unless they've got, got some really other weird factors, uh, sadism um, and, and strange um, ways of obtaining excitement, they're not likely to be uh, serial murderers. And this is, this is how it's split up. I'm not gonna go too far into this. And, um, but they split psychopathy into four different types of traits. The interpersonal ones uh, are the glibness and the grandiose sense of self-worth, pathological lying and being conning and manipulative. Um, Affective or emotional, this is that shallow emotionality that really may be at the core of psychopathy. If you don't feel like you're going to get in trouble ever, then you might do some bad stuff. Um, lifestyle, this is, this is stuff that overlaps with antisocial personality disorder and attention deficit disorder and is not necessarily just yeah. in psychopathy. And then the antisocial stuff, which is just a lot of um, criminal behavior. Um, when we think about violence um, and psychopathic violence, it's likely, as I mentioned earlier, that people high in psychopathy both plan violent acts, like a robbery, for instance, and um, just react impulsively with violence. That's unusual for people who are lower in psychopathy. Um, most violence is reactive and emotional. 
And people with psychopathy, they'll have some of that, but they'll also have um, planned instrumental violence. Um, we did a study to find out whether people with psychopathy tend to um, hurt themselves as well. And basically, we found that, I'm actually going to skip that because I think it's a little misleading, but I will tell you, we found that people with psychopathy hurt themselves for different reasons. They'll do it for manipulative reasons, but not often for serious reasons, unless they are caught um, and they want to take control. So when you hear the term suicide by cop, you might think, well, these folks are just so desperate, they want to die and they're going to jump out in front of a cop and become aggressive. So in some cases, um, people with psychopathy want to go out in a blaze of glory. I mean, that's how they see it. And they will, um, they will engage in suicide by cop. And if they can take other people out with them, sometimes that's fun. 